friend and colleague. And um, I'm actually going to start with introducing the ESI of the day. The way that we do this is the early stage investigator actually introduces you. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, I introduce her in this case, and I'm really excited to introduce Natalie Wilson, um, so who will be giving a talk um, right before you. And uh, uh, Natalie is very um, sort of beloved, long-term uh, mentee uh, of many of us on this call. So um, Dr. Natalie Wilson um, has actually worked in 20, for 25 years in primary care HIV and sexual health. Um, but as part of the end, the HIV epidemic strategy, she's really been working on um, interacting with marginalized populations, disadvantaged socioeconomic environments, and trying to look at HIV status neutral care it, for both PrEP and, and treatment um, and continuum. So she works with implementation science methods and health equity, and um, also had done a lot of work previously and continues to look at HIV symptom clusters. So really excited to hear you talk, Natalie, and then introduce um, Dr. Kellum. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Monica. So um, I'm going to uh, talk about our delivery model, um, which is healthy outcomes for people everywhere. We're calling it HOPE and uh, how we're going to deliver a status neutral approach through mobile health services. And uh, Alameda County is one of 48 U.S. jurisdictions most heavily impacted by HIV and is a target hotspot in the ending the HIV epidemic or the EHE initiative. While new di HIV diagnoses have steadily declined in San Francisco, annual new infections continue at a steady rate in Alameda County and are now the highest in our region. Over the last two decades, Oakland has been disproportionately affected by gentrification and extreme housing shortages, leading to further disparities predominantly within African-American communities. So despite only making up 24% of Oakland's population and, and only 10% of the Alameda County population, new HIV infections are concentrated in African-Americans accounting for 42% of new diagnoses countywide. So, so from 2017 to 2019, African-American men had 5.2 times the diagnosis rate as white men and African-American women had 8.3 times the diagnosis rates of white women. Due to the high incidence of HIV infection among African-American communities in Alameda County, there has been a declared state of emergency since 1998. So let's say I'm a person at risk for HIV, living in poverty with three kids and a nine to five job that I take the bus to from work. So my schedule away from my household is from 7.30 a.m. to 6.30 p.m. What we do is we ask people to fit into our system, which is an institutional paradigm with structural barriers. The traditional healthcare system is really failing African-Americans who are less likely to link to be linked to HIV care, be retained in care, and be virally suppressed compared to whites. Similar disparities are seen in the HIV prevention continuum with lower rates of pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP uptake among African-Americans. So the traditional healthcare system may appear like this to someone in the black community. And accessing the health system feels like this and people eventually are just left out in the ocean, their community. Multiple intersectional insecurities contribute to these disparities in HIV prevention and care, including stigma, racism and discrimination, medical mistrust, lack of access to medical care, transport barriers, housing and food insecurities, uh, COVID restrictions, and even cost. African-American communities have expressed interest in a more holistic, equitable approach to healthcare where goal of viral suppression and prevention must also include basic social and economic support needs. It is necessary to build health equity by understanding populations we are working with. And this may require creating engaging, creating and engaging with partnerships, providing key services. We need to reimagine systems. 
and make transformative system level changes based on outcome data and implementation science. We need to drive improvements based on the well being of communities, along with our provision of population health. And we need to focus on integrated models of care, partnering with community based organizations and health leadership. In this context, we are focused on a mobile health clinic model. Mobile health clinics serve communities by delivering convenient and necessary services directly to clients in their proximal environments and improving access to care. Through this infrastructure change, mobile clinics can reduce logistical barriers such as transportation, long wait times, complex administrative processes, and uh, people who have to leave their belongings unsecured, they can access health care uh, and stay close to where they, they stay. So the CIFAR HOPE project is using intersectionality, the intersectionality enhanced consolidated framework for implementation science research, or CIFAR, to guide our work in the EHE pillars of pre prevent and treat. We're focused on populations at high risk for HIV in Alameda County, Oakland jurisdictions, and we are engaging the community of providers, leaders, community members to develop and evaluate our model. To address intersectional barriers to delivering effective HIV services, we are expanding integrated HIV prevention and care using a status neutral approach delivered using a mobile medical unit. And part of this is that we are gonna be outcomes driven, person focused and expand the traditional uh, clinic. Um, our healthy, uh, our whole clinical model will offer a one-stop shop for HIV prevention treatment services in Alameda County. The status neutral approach is a delivery model that focuses on the HIV, and Kate, uh, HIV care engagement, regardless of HIV status post-testing. And it's person focused, healthcare, providing holistically, um, providing holistic care within the community. And it's flexible to meet the needs of the people in the community and provide a complementary approach to the HIV care continuum with the expansion of traditional clinic services. So currently we're engaging with key stakeholders to refine the status neutral mobile health clinic model uh, to provide holistic integrated HIV prevention and care and COVID response for Afri the African-American community. The emerging themes that we've uh, uh, noted are reasons why some people do not access the healthcare system and when they do access it, access it Often waiting, people often wait till they're are in so much pain or facing the perception that they're about to die to seek help. People want a culturally relevant and quality service delivery model with people who understand them and actually see them. They want a relationship with the provider. They want to receive medications on site and warm referrals to clinical partners and uh, providers such as mental health, food, and other social services. So our goal is to partner with community stakeholders to develop the whole clinic model and to evaluate preliminary implementation of this program through a six month pilot. So our hope services will include HIV and STI testing, same day prep, PEP and rapid ART initiations with STI treatment as well and rapid COVID-19 testing and vaccination services. And we will have warm handoff and referrals via case manager for housing, food, mental health, substance use treatment, and other critical services provided by stakeholder input. Here is our team. Uh, Albert Liu is my CIFAR mentor. He's been uh, really great working with me. Um, he, we also have co-investigators and experts that are actually on this call. Andrew Kirkhoff, Orlando Harris, Hyman. Scott, Susan Buckbinder, and our community partners, uh, CalPEP with Stephanie Cornwell and East Bay Getting to Zero with Sammy Lubega. This is a picture of the uh, HOPE mobile clinic, which was previously used for COVID-19 prevention studies with Bridge HIV and is being repurposed. Uh, with, let's see, with this model of, of care, the end game is to build thriving and healthy communities with hope and in the HIV uh, epidemic. So with that, I'll take a couple of questions if I still have time. 
Yes, a couple minutes for questions, please. And anyone can say it in the chat or just raise, you know, just speak out loud. I mean, I think this is phenomenal. And, um, you know, one question I had is, I think the, the HRSA, CDC, NIH is really committed to this work. Um, I think we need to go back to uh, the pillars of the and the HIV epidemic. And so hopefully you're gonna have plenty of funding opportunities to uh, keep on working on this because this is the next step. Thank you. No questions? Okay, uh, I will, maybe I went too fast. <laughs> I was trying to stay on time. <laughs> um, so, uh, next, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, uh, our keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Connie Kellum. Dr. Kellum uh, received her MD from UCSF, completed the Robert Wood Johnson Fellowship, her MPH and Infectious Disease Fellowship at the University of Washington. She is a professor of global health, medicine, and epidemiology, and the director of the International Clinic Research Center and Center for AIDS research at the University of Washington. Connie's research interests and expertise have focused on HIV prevention strategies, including HIV prep and the prevention and treatment of sexually transmitted infections. Uh, she has co-led the Partners PrEP study, which demonstrated high efficacy of FTC TDF prophylaxis for PrEP. Uh, and this study contributed to the FDA approval of PrEP for HIV prevention. She has also conducted research on implementation of oral PrEP among young African women, as well as a crossover study of oral PrEP and uh, uh, the piburine ring among adolescent and young African women. Uh, she is part of the leadership of Empower 22 efficacy trial. And um, she is currently also co-leading a doxycycline post-exposure prophylaxis for STI prevention among MSM and transgender women in San Francisco and Seattle with uh, Dr. Uh, with Annie. Um, she uh, established an organization in Africa in which she supports the education for young girls. And she is just a committed leader and rigorous scientist uh, that has, has been long committed to the science of prevention of disease globally and in our homeland. She has made many contributions to the field. Connie will be discussing HIV and STI prevention among African young women and the US MSM and transgender women. Oh, welcome. Thank Dr. you, Dr. Adam. <laughs> Your talk was great, and thank you so much for the kind introduction. I had to pare the scope of my talk back a little bit when I realized I had less time than I thought had I read <laughs> my initial email more closely. <laughs> and we want time for questions, so. If yeah, so I will um, try to move quickly. Can you see my slides? You see them? Not yet. Really? Let's not do something crazy. Let's do this. Okay. Now can you see them? Yes. Great. So thank you. And I'm going to try to um, cover a fair amount of ground. This basically kind of represents a lot of the work I've been doing since we had that wonderful result with Partners Prep. And uh, however, it wasn't uh, something that that efficacy was not observed for tenofovir based prep among young uh, African women in the voice in pin prep trials. And it really bothered me that the mantra became young women can't and won't use PrEP because of those two efficacy trials where uptake and adherence was low. So I really decided to um, spend, I, I took a short sabbatical in South Africa and the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine trying to understand like how can we offer this um, exciting new prevention modality to young women. And maybe there are different uh, things that we need to be thinking about to make this a feasible intervention form. So really the key questions that I uh, tried to undertake during that phase, which is roughly from about 2015 until the present is, will 
you know, first of all, will young African women take oral PrEP? Um, can we demonstrate that the, hopefully the answer is yes. <coughs> uh, and I'll tell you some studies that looked at that. And then recognizing that adherence is likely gonna be the Achilles heel um, for any kind of user dependent strategy in younger populations, uh, including young African women, what strategies support higher adherence and persistence? Um, what impact could PrEP have in this key population? And getting outside of the clinical trial realm, how do we actually deliver it in more real world settings? And then lastly, how do we increase PrEP options and choice in this and other populations? So we had uh, several studies, <laughs> the first of which was HPT082 funded by NIH, which it, um, we designed in 2000. 15, 16, and then um, implemented over the subsequent few years. So that was the first study. And it really was designed in the context of a lot of skepticism, whether daily oral prep was feasible for young women. And then we um, also uh, did a study, again, NIH funded through the microbicide trials network uh, to see among young women uh, where for both oral prep and the depivirine ring, uh, use was lower than in older women. Um, we did a crossover study, and this was presented uh, at CROI 2022 and last year at the um, IS meeting. So I'll summarize that. And then lastly, uh, we did a study called POWER that was scaling up uh, prevention models um, and really focusing on delivery and how do we actually integrate PrEP into uh, youth-friendly services in Africa, uh, specifically in South Africa and Kenya. So real quickly, um, try not to get caught up in too many details, but HPT082 was designed to uh, really answer the question of um, uptake and what are what is the proportion of women who would use um, PrEP versus decline it, and what are their characteristics, and then whether or not um, drug-level feedback would be uh, a motivating factor and improve uh, PrEP adherence. So the way we designed this study was to enroll uh, women who were uh, not infected with HIV between the ages of 16 and 25 in Johannesburg and Cape Town, South Africa, and Harare, Zimbabwe. And we capped the number of women who didn't want to take PrEP at enrollment at 200. And, uh, had the target to enroll 400 women who would accept PrEP. We screened women based on a voice, the voice risk score. For those who don't know what that is, it was um, really, it dates back to the um, late, you know, sort of 2008 period where the voice trial, which was an efficacy trial of oral and topical tenofovir-based PrEP, um, had characteristics that predicted HIV seroconversion. So, were you married? Did you have? Uh, did you get support from your partner? Did you use alcohol? And did you have um, bacterial STIs or herpes? So we use that to try to enrich the population for women who would most likely benefit from PrEP. And then secondly, we, um, with help from Sybil Hosick, who is a co-investigator on this study, uh, developed a, uh, a measure of HIV prevention readiness that was adapted from the Adolescent Trials Network HIV Treatment Readiness Measure. Uh, and I don't have time to tell you about all that, but just so you have an understanding of the population. And one of the first findings was to our and many people's surprise is there was almost universal um, uptake of PrEP. So as I said, we had capped it at 200 um, non-PrEP initiators. And in fact, um, we only have something like 36 women uh, who didn't start PrEP at enrollment. So that was interesting. Uh, there was certainly interest and it, it varied a little bit by the three sites, but not a lot. We also found that we did uh, recruit a high-risk cohort. The median voice uh, score was seven, which is associated with a 5% HIV incidence um, in prior cohorts. Uh, condom use was very inconsistent uh, in the majority of women. STI prevalence was alarmingly high, and you'll hear this theme come up. Almost 25% uh, of women uh, had chlamydia at uh, enrollment, and another 7% had uh, gonorrhea. 
intimate partner violence was reported um, by almost, you know, it depended in, uh, it varied by uh, city, but it was uh, between a third to a half. So that again is a notable finding. And uh, depressive symptoms were reported by 42%. And really these were women who did not have experience taking oral contraceptive pills. So you might expect adherence challenges. We tried to design a um, semi-qualitative way of giving drug level feedback using kind of the cell phone signals, like if you were in the green zone, um, it wasn't perfect adherence, but associated with taking on average the equivalent of about four pills a week, which uh, from MSM studies was associated with very high PrEP efficacy. And eventually we'll have such uh, data for women, but we didn't at the time we designed it. And then intermediate use, which covers quite a broad spectrum of any use to up to four, the equivalent of four pills a week, and then no use. And we tried to give non-judgmental counseling that saying, good work, keep it up, or looks like you're trying, but maybe you need, let's talk about what's a challenge for you in taking it in the yellow zone. And then in the red zone, looks like you haven't taken any in the last four to six months, or four to six weeks, let's talk about that. And what we found, um, the key outcome in this randomized trial where women either received uh, the drug level feedback or not is that um, there was no difference. So even though it seemed like a good idea, at least in this context, the way it was implemented did not improve adherence. And you know, we, we were doing this at the time on the heels of the voice and fin prep trials, and we were hoping to get um, better adherence than had been had been observed there and you know overall um, at using any detectable tenofovir diphosphate as a measure of at least they took a pill in the last uh, four to six weeks we had almost 85 percent of women who had at the three month time point dropped down to about a little over 50 percent at six months and down to 30 percent at 12 months. And then using greater than 700 fentanyls per punch um, as a measure of high adherence, it was you know about a quarter of women had high adherence at three months, dropped down to about 20% at six months, and then down to really less than 10% at 12 months. So the you know it was not like a home run by any means in terms of um, getting high adherence, but at least we had a sense that women were motivated, they did take it and uh, but their adherence dropped off at uh, six months and beyond when the visits spread out to be quarterly visits. One of the other interventions we offered were adherence clubs. I took this photo in Cape Town when about 90 women uh, came to the site because someone in the group had read the, uh, the package insert and it said something about fat changes, abdominal uh, weight gain and they were really concerned about it. And it was clear that, you know, they, these um, adherence clubs were pretty, um, pretty interactive and uh, useful, it seemed, from my vantage point anyway, for young women to ask questions about PrEP because this was really, think back, this was in 2017. There were no national guidelines uh, at the time in South Africa or Zimbabwe for PrEP in this population. And it was uh, a really, it was fun to watch. They were, uh, as soon as they had their questions about weight gain and fat distribution addressed, they went on to talk about boyfriend issues and sort of um, talk about non-medical issues. Um, so in summary, we learned from HPT and OA2 that PrEP initiation was quite high, over 90%. Um, over half, um, persisted with PrEP through 12 months if you use the, uh, that's really should be through six months, and it dropped down to about 10% over uh, 12 months. And uh, high adherence was much, you know, was lower than that, but still for a subset, I guess what I would say is that for a quarter to a half of, a quarter to a, a fifth of women, that they had high adherence at least through month six. So we shouldn't abandon this strategy for, uh, young women, uh, but drug level feedback did not seem to make a difference here. But I, um, 
if we have time, maybe we can talk about this more because really it's hard when you think about it, you're giving someone a result, asking them to think back to what they did four to six weeks ago. Their recollection didn't always jive with the drug level feedback. And it wasn't clear to me that this was really a winning strategy or feasible from a cost perspective. Um, what we did notice, it, it seemed like the, the combination of services they received was having an impact. Our counterfactual incidence for this cohort was 3.7%, uh, whereas uh, we observed an HIV incidence of 1%, very high prevalence of curable SDIs, and we need to find better prep strategies. I'm just, I think I'll skip over this because of time, but just to let you know that around the same time, I, we did do another study funded through NIH in collaboration with Linda Gale Becker to try to see if um, cash incentives, very modest incentives of about $10 plus drug level feedback would help uh, women do uh, better with adherence. And there was some suggestion in the ITT analysis that women who received incentives for having high uh, tenofovir diphosphate levels did better. But again, it's not like a, wasn't in my opinion, a home run. And we also found in the, you don't need to read the details here, but I think what I'll tell you this story in another study too, is that women, and this is I think probably true of any population, they're going to start, stop, restart, um, and the subset will persist. Um, with PrEP, but um, we really need it in delivery to be prepared that this is not like starting treatment where hopefully people will persist without interruptions. And some of it's due to logistics. You know, people have other things happening in their lives. Some of it is they no longer um, feel they need it. So, and in this context, again, um, we found that a minority, but not a trivial minority, um, did persist with PrEP. Again, similar HIV, I'm sorry, similar STI prevalence with, um, in this context in Cape Town, a third of women having chlamydia, gonorrhea, or trick, and no HIV seroconversions. Um, touch on the REACH study, which was presented at CROI 2022 by my colleague, Kenneth Naguri from Kenya that we were trying in this context to um, understand whether the depivirine ring, which is inserted once a month, would be um, used in greater, uh, whether women, young women would use the ring and or oral prep um, in a crossover design. And um, this was really designed to basically enroll women and randomize them either to the ring and then they'd switch over to oral prep or vice versa. Each of these periods was six months and then we had a choice period. And what we presented at um, CROI was that in this context, um, the adherence was measured um, using the same kind of cutoffs I just showed you in the hp 2 for oral prep and then using residual drug levels in the ring to try to quantify non-use, some use, or uh, what we think is consistent with um, keeping the ring in for a month. And then we looked at the proportion of visits with high adherence between the crossover and choice periods for each product. Again, similar cohort, but I, I really wanna point out, this is, this is a challenging age group. Think about what you were doing at age 18 and probably being in a clinical trial was not uh, high on your list of things you were doing. And these were young women that were um, almost, you know, 90% were not married. However, 40% had ever been um, pregnant. Some had a sizable proportion started contraception before uh, as in the screening period for the REACH trial. And um, very few had their own income and a sizable proportion were in secondary school. So they had other things happening. And in this context, we found, we were really pleased actually that they, we found very few in red to have no use of products. Um, virtually no one in the oral prep arms in the crossover period or choice periods and very few in the ring had um, no use. And most, um, you know, a majority had uh, high uh, prep use in the crossover period and choice period for oral prep. 
more in the moderate um, some use in ring, but still, this was good. This was much better than had been observed in prior clinical trials. And we also learned, interestingly, oops, sorry, what did I do there? Um, that the predictors of choosing oral prep in the choice period were having high adherence in the crossover period. We did not find that association for ring use. But again, I'm not sure how easy it is to give people um, drug level feedback about um, the depivirine ring residual drug level. So it may be that partly we didn't find that because it uh, was harder to deliver that in terms of the yellow, uh, the red, yellow, green zones for ring versus oral prep um, use. So we were pleased that um, the other finding was that about two thirds of the women in uh, the REACH study chose to use the ring when given a choice of products after six months of use of uh, both oral prep and ring um, each. And uh, that basically adherence was pretty high and uh, we learned some things about predictors of choice. The last study I'll tell you about, um, please get, let me know if I'm running over too much. Um, is POWER, and this was funded from USAID uh, and was with a lot of partners in uh, Kenya and South Africa. And we finished this study up about a year ago. And this was a study where we're really looking at delivery models. And one model was in Cape Town with the 2 2 teen tester shown on the bottom left. Johannesburg, that doesn't look like a very active clinic, but trust me, it usually is. It's a youth-friendly clinic that really is um, designed to be a model uh, for adolescent friendly services. And on the right in Kisumu, really PrEP was embedded within family planning clinics, one private and one public. Similar pattern, I won't go into this in great detail because it's very similar to what we've seen in the other studies. Here, the median age was 21. And again, um, very few uh, women were married. Most had a, a current partner, but only one and most uh, two thirds didn't know their partner's uh, HIV status and um, a quarter never used con uh, condoms. So sexually active with a single partner, again, in that context, you might find surprising that again, we found 29% with chlamydia, 10% with gonorrhea. These were, uh, we, you know, we took a pretty light touch to the screening here, so this was not, using the voice risk score to enroll. I also want you to note that on that top row that only 7% of women had STI symptoms. So that what we've uncovered, I think, through these different studies and other people's work too, is that we have a STI epidemic that's just been neglected because syndromic management is the mainstay of treatment there. Again, over 90% of women accepted PrEP at enrollment and uh, almost all uh, initiated PrEP on the same day. And what we found here, again, is this issue that there is, um, you know, as here we did not do active follow-up. We didn't chase people down if they didn't come back. So this is probably more an indicator of real world use where about 30% persisted through one month. And then a subset of these women would stop and start. Um, and, but still a sizable minority persisted um, maybe with a gap of a couple of weeks of use, but basically um, um, a sizable proportion did continue with PrEP through six months. There are a lot of things that we've learned through the qualitative work about why is it so hard for young women, to per, young African women to persist it has to do with just being able to maintain a schedule. Um, they don't carry around diaries really holidays and exam periods, take them out of the area where they're um, living because um, people go to their home villages uh, during uh, the extended Christmas holiday. I think there is still a concern about um, potential side effects as well in, as in a minority actual experience side effects. They were do we were doing these studies when there was not widespread knowledge about PrEP. So these women were really, um, kind of the, the early adopters, if you will, but they didn't have a lot of community support. 
They were very afraid about having a bottle of pills that looked like they were on ART in their small um, uh, living situ um, places where they live, where they didn't have a lot of control over who might discover them. And they really wanted um, brief, convenient refills. They did not want blood draws. So one of the things we also nested into the power study, and I'll go through this quickly, but we worked with Christine Dellendorf and Nika Seidman at UCSF and bedsider.org who have done great work on developing sort of patient-facing decision support tools. And we developed one called MyPrep and um, built it on kind of starting with a model that they developed for my birth control. And what we tried to do is have this be like a tablet-based tool that women could flip through in a waiting room to see um, like, do I need PrEP? You know, I'm using quotes rather than statistics. Um, what are your options to prevent HIV? What do you need to know about PrEP? And instead of giving uh, statistics, sort of putting things in buckets of the good stuff, the annoying stuff, stuff not to worry about, as well as um, myths and misconceptions about PrEP. And we evaluated this in a randomized trial in a very real world, um, public clinic uh, in Johannesburg where riots happen, stockouts of family planning methods happen, and tried to understand whether women's um, uptake of PrEP and persistence with PrEP was influenced by being exposed to the PrEP decision support tool. And what we found, you know, again, you'll, you may say, ooh, that's pretty low um, persistence, but it was um, about twice as high in the uh, group who had the decision support tool compared to those who just were exposed to a general health website. So a signal that maybe this kind of patient facing support tool will give women a more confidence, more um, information to, and hopefully more motivation to persist. So in summary, what we've learned through these projects is that um, we, a lot. We've learned a lot. I'd say that women will um, use it, can use it. A minority will persist with it. A daily pill is not easy for women who are having, on average, sex once a week. It doesn't probably make sense to them that why should I have to do something daily when my expose, when my sexual exposure is happening much less frequently. I think we've learned a lot about demand creation, integrated service delivery models, and the needs of users and providers. I think what I've learned is that um, these young women are not like, <laughs> they're not victims. They do have agency. Um, they face a lot of challenges. In many of these communities, the unemployment rate is 70% overall and even higher among youth. We have to recognize and address that. Um, I felt very encouraged by the high uptake. Women want HIV prevention, and but they also have other needs, depression, intimate partner violence. Uh, we have to do something more than what we're doing now with syndromic management to address the curable STI prevalence of almost a third of these women. They care about fertility and uh, they need diagnostic testing and treatment. Um, and I think we also recognize this is this was a first generation prep project, just like the oral contraceptive pills were, you know, 50 years ago, and that we need better options to improve uptake and effective use. And so I think we learned as we went um, about uh, adherence, about um, how to support women's choice, and um, and that it is feasible to implement and. However, I also think, and Sybil Hosek sort of keeps reminding me this, that when you're working with adolescents, that you might need more than a light touch to retain them in prep. And that we need to simplify and streamline our delivery. We need to make prep uh, non-stigmatizing and we need to demedicalize prep and be creative about what we put prep into for pills, about support groups, um, resupply, pharmacy pickups, and HIV self-testing. Like, there's a lot of great work at uh, CROI about this, and I encourage people to look those posters and oral presentations up because I think we're getting better at this. But I also think we really learned, uh, like from the REACH study, is that PrEP can't be a one-size-fits-all. We've been saying that for years, but I think that the REACH studies really show us that 
even though maybe the efficacy of the ring is lower, two thirds of women chose to use it and it worked better for them. They didn't have to think about it between the once monthly insertion. So choice is going to be essential. And I'm now just going to end up real quickly about monthly as slatterier because that's what I've spent the last uh, couple of years focusing on. And I believe that a once a month pill could be a game changer, but the road is not never predictable and not always easy. But why a slatrivir? Um, sorry, I skipped a slide. Because it is a very highly potent uh, form of a uh, basically a nucleoside reverse transcriptase um, inhibitor that also permanently inhibits translocation. And because of its high potency, where you could give it um, once a month, excellent resistance profile, uh, excellent safety and tolerability, long half-life and good tissue distribution, it really seemed like this might be an ideal um, product for daily do or sorry, monthly dosing. Merck has um, a uh, both prevention and treatment portfolio for a slatrivir. With prevention, their hope is that it will be a once a month um, oral pill with size of a potentially the size of a um, small aspirin, not like the horse pills of um, Truvada or um, FTC TDF. And a, farther behind is the idea of a once yearly implant. They also were, um, and I'll tell you the story here, we're looking at. Um, are still looking, I should say, at once daily eslatvir and durabrine, as well as um, once weekly eslatvir with a, um, a candidate uh, in an RTI. So we had this, uh, worked with Merck with funding from Gates Foundation to design and start implementation of a 4,500 participant trial. First time, to my knowledge, that an efficacy HIV prevention efficacy trial also enrolled, was planning to enroll women from the US as well as African sites. It's a non-active comparator study. So we have a monthly, everyone in the study gets a monthly pill and a daily pill, and they get randomized, of course, to active at Slatrivir and a FTC TDF placebo or active FTC TDF daily or monthly um, placebo that looks identical to Slatrivir. It was designed to have a sentinel cohort with interim analysis of safety at uh, 400 women, and that it was uh, designed to have um, up to 40 uh, confirmed HIV cases with an interim look at 25 uh, seroconversions. And that's just the graphic of that. Well, life happens. <laughs> Life in November and December was pretty active for the Empower teams. And I should say there's a comparable trial um, among MSM and transgender women in the Americas, Japan, Africa, and, um, and I think Thailand. And so the first signal that maybe there was an issue with lymphocytes happened in mid-November when the treatment study using 20 milligrams once a week um, with a candidate uh, in an RTI, MK8507, was stopped because of a pretty significant decline in CD4 counts. And these were people who had been on Victarbi and were doing just great and then got randomized to, um, uh, to a Slatrivir weekly plus um, this novel in RTI. So that um, basically, all the um, data from uh, the initial phase two study was analyzed and they found that there was a decrease in mean lymphocytes in, in the Slatvir PrEP study, but they were still in the normal range and, it, and not associated with any adverse events. So we made participants aware. And then two weeks later, um, our external data monitoring committee reviewed unblinded data and recommended, ah, let's pause enrollment until we have that Sentinel cohort data. And we added in more frequent monitoring of lymphocytes every month instead of every three months and added in uh, CD4 counts. And then to a week later, <laughs> it was a busy month, uh, the FDA put the Slatrivir prevention trial on hold um, to, and basically all dosing was stopped and all participants were informed of safety findings and offered open label FTC TDF. So we are, we're, we in a very 
um, literal meaning of the word we, uh, all the trial um, investigators and Merck and um, with Gates Foundation are trying to actively get the, um, the, the Slatfer um, program off a complete hold to a partial hold. Um, we're doing a lot of digging into not only the data on reversibility of lymphocytes, but also doing mouse models to try to understand mechanisms of the lymphocyte decrease, PK modeling to come up with a lower dose that hopefully can enter into trials. And stay tuned. Um, and I think I will um, pause, I'll stop here. I think I was going to tell you in the meantime, maybe I'll just show you one slide. While you know, what do you do when you're put on hold and yet all the funding's encumbered at sites, right? Horrible thing to happen right before the holidays. So what we are currently doing, and I'll just end on this, is to um, try to engage the 21 sites in Africa on a observational cohort. Well, we'll, we'll use the recency testing to better learn how well it provi provides a counterfactual HIV incidence, which the FDA would like for these active comparator HIV prevention trials. They'll offer women, uh, these are not the Empower 22 participants, but a new cohort. This will basically be a cohort with about 3,000 women offered uh, oral prep. We'll do uh, discrete choice experiments to understand their preferences for attributes of long-acting formulations, including um, kind of the trade-off on a lower dose that might have a tighter window, less forgiveness. And we will continue to implement the, um, that patient-facing PrEP decision support tool to try to understand now that we have the pivoting ring, soon we'll have Cab LA, what are women's actual choices at the end of six months. So I'm gonna stop there and open up for questions. And I hope that was clear and not too fast. Um, and sorry that didn't have time to talk about some of the work that Annie and I are doing on doxypep, but um, maybe another time we can talk about that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that was a great and comprehensive talk. And I've always really admired your work on the demonstration projects in PrEP, which really, in women, which really belies the pharmacokinetic data. What I mean is you have to like really look at PrEP in real world populations and see how many doses are necessary, I think, for women to um, be protected. And that I think your work was really formative in, in that. Um, I wanted to ask, and then we have a lot of, please, anyone, um, you know, you can unmute and ask, ask your questions. Uh, I want, I was also very disappointed by his uh, uh the halting of his Latrovir, and um, wondering if you, you know, now that we have this data from Croy that you, um, about the Calvitegravir and HP10083 and, and the Sue Eshelman data about uh, having to do, the idea of maybe doing RNA testing before, yeah, and not every two months, but, but before you give the next cabinet how do you, what do you see practically happening in, in more resource limited settings for cabinet every eight weeks in terms of trying to diagnose stealth, you know, at, at, at yeah. low level that HIV is happening? I think it's going to be a huge challenge personally. Yeah. Because um, when you think about um, so FTC TDF and um, through PEPFAR costs $40 a year for a year's supply, right? And then if you layer in creatinine testing and a few other things, it's probably like $200 a year for each PrEP person, someone on PrEP for a year in PEPFAR countries. So from what I understand, and I think a lot of this is still a, very much a work in progress, that the, the goal for Cab LA is it's going to have to, you know, we recognize that not everyone clearly can use um, daily oral FTC TDF, but it's got to be pretty co cost neutral because uh, it's just you can't do, in my opinion, I just don't understand how we can do every two yes. months um, viral load testing. It's going to kick the costs up over that substantially, let alone, and not even talking about the healthcare costs of giving a every two month injection plus the drug costs. So I think what people need to be really reckoning with is that PEPFAR is a zero sum game in terms of HIV prevention. So we know we need more coverage. We know that 
there's better efficacy, probably as uh, Rafi says, because of better coverage with Cab LA due to not having the adherence issues. But the cost and deliver, delivery issues are going to be paramount. Yeah, so, I, I mean, are we I mean, maybe to... not making enemy the perfect of the good? Exactly. Yeah. And I, I think we have to say, okay, so there were what, five integrase um, resistance mutations observed, but many more infections averted. So, are we willing to be accept a little bit of integrase uh, resistance in the if we don't do viral load testing due to the long tail, but get get it out there to people who really need it. Um, so those the demonstration projects will really be important. You know, hopefully we'll do them in a more coordinated and better and faster way than happened with tenofovir based prep, where it felt like everyone had these, not everyone, but many little projects happened, but none were really powered to answer these key questions. So it took us longer. Thank you so much. And um, we have other questions coming in. Uh, it looks like Matt has a question and Kate Koss. Great, uh, excellent talk. Thanks, thanks so much. I, I was curious what uh, what you think the differences were in the reach um, population as compared to HPTN OA2, explaining the adherence being so much higher. Do you think it was really yeah. the population or the intervention? Yeah, thanks, Matt. That's a great question. I think we learned um, so. Sybil Hosek helped us design the adherence interventions from from both and reach was designed as we were finishing up 082. And I think we realized that um, we got better at drug level feedback counseling. I have to say, I totally underestimated the, the just operational aspects. Cause when you think about it, there's getting the sample to the lab and time to get the results back. Then you, the counselors have to really not focus on the number. You know, you have to like, we don't care honestly if it's 680 versus 712, but like give the message in a supportive way. I think we got better at um, the, in REACH we did a menu of choices so women could say, oh, I wanna be in an adherence support club or I want to weigh SMS. And that kind of flexibility may have mattered. Um, but they were, if anything, the population was slightly younger and um, they, some of them required um, parental assent. I think that may have actually helped. I was always of the mind that young women need autonomy. They shouldn't have to have parental um, assent or consent and their assent to participate. But in fact, I think we learned in REACH that having the parents be aware and be supportive was actually quite helpful. These women, uh, young women, then didn't have to worry about disclosure or inadvertent find, you know, what their parents would think about if they found the product. That's helpful, thanks. Yeah. Kate. Hi, Connie, thanks so much. That was absolutely terrific. Um, I actually had a similar question to Matt and was just thinking about you know, the really impressive results of REACH and, and scaling that up as we move toward you know, the ring becoming available alongside oral prep. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, was it monthly follow-up and sort of like having that more kind of intense interaction? And what do you think about Sort of that, that higher is, touch, like how, how is that going to happen in the real world? What do you think about, you know, as we move forward? Um, yeah, well, I didn't really say it explicitly, but REACH was designed for two purposes. One was to provide safety data um, so that it could be, if it was licensed, it would go down to 16 and 17 year olds. So because of that objective, it was also much more intensive monitoring and we really wanted to make sure that women were taking it because you can't interpret safety data if they're not using it. Um, but it's definitely not the model of delivery. So I think, um, I, I can't imagine that we would ever give drug level feedback, like who's gonna really grind up rings and give that kind of drug level feedback in the real world. But I think what I, uh, and I'd love to hear, you know, like Monica's worked on the, uh, developed this urine tenofovir assay. Maybe one of the implications of the REACH findings is that if women get the validation, if you will, that they're actually using it, that that might motivate the subset who can and want to use oral prep. And for those who can't, then you could say, well, 
the ring may be for you, but we're not, you know, we have to do that in a way that doesn't require monthly visits. And I, there's just no way that's a, a feasible intervention. And we can't afford the cost of shipping DBS for tenofovir assays or uh, dipivirine ring assays. But I do think the adherence menu is a great approach because women kind of know like, you are gonna annoy me so much if you send me two way SMSs, but I really would like to be on a WhatsApp chat. And I would like, you know, give me a call in a week. Let me know that you're thinking of me and things like that. So that flexible approach is cool. Um, but let's, I'm going to write you so we can talk about the urinalysis. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, Al, Al Lu had a question. Thanks, Monica. Um, wonderful talk, Connie. Thanks so much. Um, it's amazing, the um, breadth of um, amazing work that you've done. Um, I had a question about um, PEP. Um, there was a fair amount of uh, PEP coverage at um, Croy and sort of, um, I think, an interest in rethinking how PEP is being delivered. And when you were um, talking about um, people start, starting and stopping a lot, uh, it made me think a little bit about PEP. And yeah. so I was wondering what your thoughts about that, uh, particularly for young women. Yeah, it's a really good question, Al, and I, I feel like I should think about it more. Um, the challenges are uh, getting in within 72 hours. I, I, mean, I guess if you sent women out with a PEP starter package, that would get around that issue. Um, I, I really, and I'd love to hear Kate's thoughts about this because she's worked on PrEP and I think PEP as well through search. I feel like we it's, um, something we just honestly haven't paid attention to very much. When we've done these various PrEP trials, you know, the pharmacies have PEP um, there, but very little use of it. And I think it's because we don't, we don't talk to participants or women about it. We just sort of, my sense is people are silent about it and that, that needs to be addressed. But Kate, do you have thoughts about that? Yeah, thanks, Connie. I, the work in search really led by James Iacco was presented a bit at Croy, and I think that um, that you're right that offering it as an option is, is sometimes a surprise to people. It's often compartmentalized in sort of occupational exposures or things like that as opposed to sexual exposures. So I think it's a great option, and I think we're learning a lot in sort of this current phase of search Sapphire about offering PEP alongside PrEP. Um, so we'll hopefully have more to share um, kind of in the rural Kenya and Uganda contexts. Yeah. And probably better regimens too, right? Like, like yeah, exactly. simpler regimens, not 28 days would be huge. Yeah. And then Natalie, uh, last question, then we'll turn to our next space. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Hey, thank you. Wonderful talk. And uh, my question was, you said that 96% of the women accepted PrEP. And then you showed different um, mo modalities of, of PrEP. And I am wondering if you... Do you see a difference between age ranges, young versus probably older uh, women? Um, and it, in terms of which is preferred and what were the like top three? Like if we were to offer it like on hope, uh, like what would be the main ones we would wanna do for women? Yeah, great question, Natalie. And um, so in the studies where that we, I showed there, we really, other than the REACH study, we only offered oral PrEP. But um, so, but to answer, so don't really have the answer you're looking for from the studies we did, but um, uh, Ariane van der Straten and colleagues uh, from RTI have uh, done studies where they've used kind of hypothetical products and said, would you prefer a monthly or every two monthly injection? and implant and so on. And clearly in Africa, so this is really different context where most contraception is injectable Depo-Provera or net and providers and patients or clients um, really prefer injections. So I think there is a sense that cab LA will be well received because it's fast, it's easy. You know, there's not a lot of Depo-Provera used in the US. So, so it would be a really relevant question and maybe you could, uh, something worth talking with Nika Seidman and Christine Dellendorf about is 
um, and we're happy, you know, the tool we developed was kind of for the African context, but you could use it and hope and see what women want um, as we get more options. Um, and from the insight cohort, I think we will get that answer to your question because we are going to say you've used oral prep for or we've we've offered it to you for six months many of whom will use it now what would you like and so that's the question because i think that as we move into options um we might find that we'll offer them in a hierarchical way you know and, and al and susan are doing some really great work on this too about how do you actually offer choice do you start with the world prep or you just immediately give people a choice. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Connie. We really appreciate you being here. It was fantastic. And um, we're going to move on to our next phase. But thank you again. And I will yep. be with you separately. Thank you. And I will have to drop off now. But thank you. Okay. So much. I, anytime I get a request from San Francisco, I have to say yeah, <laughs> my alma mater. Next okay. person. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Carol, I'm going to turn it over to you because the next phase of this is our spotlight series um, that we spotlight different um, parts of the CIFAR. And today is the School of Nursing. So, Carol, please take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. Um, and thank you, everybody. And thanks for the invitation to talk about a little bit about the School of Nursing. Uh, my name is Carol Dawson Rose, and I know many of you. Um, I'm part of the CIFAR um, Internal Advisory Board, and I've been at UCSF doing HIV related research for over 20 years. And so our paths have crossed in many ways. Um, I We have three investigators today from the School of Nursing that are going to talk about their research, but just in brief, um, for those of you who aren't familiar, we are, we have a big enterprise in the School of Nursing where we're doing graduate education to train nurses um, as advanced practice nurses. And um, we also have a very robust research enterprise. People have been doing HIV research in the School of Nursing since the late 80s. And a lot of the studies were very focused on quality error with Bill Holtzmer led that research and also symptom burden, symptom experience, symptom management. And those are some of the areas that we had focused on in the beginning of the ep epidemic. Um, we continue today with many investigators within the school that are involved in HIV research. And as I said before, many of us have collaborated across um, campus and beyond the campus. And we, I'm really excited about our stronger relationship with CIFAR. And so I'm very grateful to have this opportunity today. I'm gonna turn it over to our first speaker. Um, and we will see how we do on questions uh, after each speaker. We have a little bit of time, but there are three different speakers. So here we go. Our first um, presenter is Dr. Orlando Harris. He's an assistant professor in the Department of Community Health Systems. Um, he also has a joint appointment with the Division of Prevention Sciences. His research focuses on social and cultural determinants of health, um, primarily for Caribbean men who have sex with men and transgender women. He was the recipient of a CIFAR Mentored Scientist Award in 2020. And just last week, he received the news of funding for his K-23. Um, his talk today is a qualitative study of young Jamaican gay and bisexual men and their experiences with um, school and sexuality-based violence and discrimination. Orlando. Thank you, Carol. I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen. Excellent. Uh, good morning again, everyone. Um, I just want to say uh, thank you for uh, having me and the opportunity to present the talk today. I just want to give it a quick uh, a trigger warning. Um, I'm going to share the perspective and narrative of uh, some participants or uh, partners that I interviewed in Jamaica. Um, some may find some of the words um, um, offensive. Um, however, um, let's continue. 
Uh, this is our research team, um, Dr. Charlene Jarrett, uh, myself, and uh, Professor Lee Kadung, who is the head of the um, Institute for Gender Development Studies at the University of the West Indies in uh, Jamaica. In Jamaica, homophob homophobia, harassment, verbal and sexual violence are commonplace. Uh, sexual and gender minority youth in Jamaica's public schools face many challenges um, at a delicate period when young uh, sexual and gender, gender minority adolescents are coming to terms with their own sense of self, sexual orientation, or gender identity, they face strong anti-homosexual attitudes and violence from their peers. Uh, Jamaica, and by extension, the Ministry of Health and Ministry of Education does not collect data on anti-homosexual violence directed towards sexual and gender minority individuals in public schools. And of course, violence and discrimination based on uh, sexual and gender minority status may interfere with learning and contribute to maladaptive behaviors in adulthood. The goal of the, the talk today is to talk more about the experience of young Jamaican uh, gay and bisexual men with school and sexuality-based violence and discrimination during primary, secondary, and tertiary education. Uh, we conducted qualitative uh, interviews in uh, Kingston, Jamaica, right uh, prior to the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we proposed the following research questions in order to gain uh, better insights into the experiences of young Jamaican gay and bisexual uh, men's experiences with school and sexuality-based violence and discrimination. Uh, using a purpose of sample, uh, sampling techniques, we conducted 20 individual interviews and two focus groups consisting of five uh, persons each. Um, ethics approval was obtained from uh, UCSF and uh, UE Mona campus. Uh, we approached a qualitative analysis using a stepwise process. This process includes sort of like code development, extraction, the creation of a code book, uh, tagging um, or coding large portions of text, which represented the, the central themes relevant to the topics of interest. And of course, it ended with uh, uh, construction of thematic statements. The, there are three themes that emerge uh, from the analysis, the experiences with stigma, discrimination, and patterns of violence based on their perceived sexual minority status um, that escalated from patterns of violence uh, to uh, physical, a pattern of verbal abuse to physical abuse. And of course, the second theme is the institutional response to violence and discrimination, which range, uh, uh, ranging from perception that teachers don't care uh, to teachers cannot be trusted to not disclose or respond adequately to abuse. And then finally, the third theme that emerged was the psychosocial impact of school and sexuality-based violence and discrimination, which included uh, a transfer to a lesser tiered school um, or drop out of the system altogether, which, um, or for some, it's forced disclosure of their uh, uh, sexual agenda minority status to their parents or disrupt, uh, disrupted home environments that led to neglect or homelessness. In terms of the, the, the first theme that emerged, uh, stigma and discrimination, we saw that uh, participants' narratives highlighted early exposures with homosexual stigma and discrimination. They described um, encountering mostly verbal abuse as early as primary school, so that's around from grade one through six, and both uh, verbal and physical violence as they moved through their secondary education, for, so from seven uh, to uh, grade 13, and of course, continue on into tertiary education. Uh, participants explained uh, the, that the least amount of sexuality-based discrimination occurred in primary school. They suggest that gender policing was less rigid in primary school and that uh, deviations from socially acceptable gender norms were less associated with sexual behavior, but rather with gender socialization processes between uh, and they cares. So for some participants, uh, primary school was seen as a place for feminine boys to associate themselves with female peers or express themselves freely in spite of the homoph homophobic banter they may receive from their male peers. And so one participant said, uh, when you're younger, persons don't pay too much attention to your mannerisms. But as you grow older and your mannerisms get louder, or more um, um, apparent, you get more attention. I think uh, there was a point in primary school when I was out there, meaning that I wasn't afraid to play with the girls. I got a bad rap for that, so the older boys would call me a sissy. Common, another common issue that, that came up in their narratives was the sort of like the deliberate emergence of homophobia in, in secondary school. So participants reported being expressively feminine 
uh, during their adolescent years recalled experience in homosexual stigma and discrimination from fellow students, faculty, and other school staff during their high school years. So for a majority of the participants in, our, in, my, in the sample, school-based violence they experienced was a direct result of their gender non-conforming behavior, their mannerisms, which was perceived as an affront to hegemonic masculinity principles, um, which, which ascribed strict social scripts defining maleness. So one participant ex explained, I was more the feminine type when I was in primary school, but when it was time for me to go to high school, I realized that I had to cut that out. I did not want the other boys to tease me because I was hanging, with, hanging out with the girls. The first year of high school, everyone thought I was just this horrible person, which I wasn't. It was just me trying to cut that feminine part out. I didn't flash my wrist or anything like that. Another participant explained, when we're in the seventh grade, everything, was, everything started out good and mellow until the end when some of the boys started mixing with the older boys in school. They tried to act like a big man, so more masculine, calling me a faggot. Uh, that was interesting. What was interesting is that if you're a masculine and you do the gayest uh, things, persons wouldn't make much comment about it. They would just laugh it off. But if you're effeminate, then the slightest thing you do, they make a big deal out of it. For us feminine boys, we would get some beating from the older boys for that. And of course, most of the incidents of homophobic violence did not occur in isolation or by one single perpetrator, but instead by a group of male assailants. And so one participant expressed, I think it was, I was in the ninth grade and I was on my way to woodwork. It's uh, women takes um, home economics, boys take uh, uh, carpentry. Um, when I was backed up in a corner by a group of tw uh, 12 uh, grade boys who then attacked me, I later found out that it was because I was gay. I felt awful. Plus, I didn't want to go back to school um, anymore because it was all over the school and everyone started calling me a faggot after that. There was another example where this gentleman said, there was this one time when I was in high school and homeless at the time, jumping from one uh, man's house to the next. I was um, on the sports team at school. One of my friends thought he was helping me by going to my coach to tell him that I was homeless and sleeping with older men for, sh older men for shelter. Instead of helping me, the coach told the entire team that I was a faggot. Later that afternoon, I went to practice and was attacked by some of my teammates. The coach stood outside the entire time and did nothing to stop it. Participants also expressed the view that um, engaging in same-sex sexual behaviors on school property was dangerous, regardless of sexual orientation. An empty classroom or a bathroom were two of the most common places for students to engage in sort of like sexual exploration. Participants reported that consequences not only include mob style physical attacks by peers, but possibly assault from security personnel, uh, verbal abuse from teachers or other school officials in positions of authority. They also reported that the revelation of uh, their same sexual behaviors to their parents and, and the school could lead to suspension or expulsion. And so one participant detailed this a little further. There was this one time in high school where someone was beaten up because of rumors that he was gay. They were in the bathroom fooling around and got caught. One of the guys was chased by other students. He had to run to the principal's office for rescue. After the incident, he had to have a teacher escort him to and from class, um, his classes. Knowing how the society is, I felt that was really reckless on their part uh, to do that in the bathroom. Something good came out of it though. It reminded me to always be on guard, extra defensive, absolutely no slip ups. Another participant even uh, went further to talk about some of the other consequences that you may face as a, um, as a, a young man engaging in sexual exploration. It started out at one of the most all boys high school here in Jamaica. Everything was going really well until something bad happened. Me and this guy liked fool around in a classroom. I always heard about students being caught doing stuff in the bathroom. So I made up my mind that I wasn't going to any of the bathrooms. We got caught by a male security guard. He brought us to the principal's office. I was 14, I was scared. The principal kept screaming expletives at, at us and said that we were bringing down the reputation of the institution with it being an all boys school. He called our parents in and told them what had happened. I was scared to my wits because I didn't know what daddy, how daddy would react. Shortly after the principal, uh, principal expelled us, I bounced around from one lower tiered school to the next because of the bullying and because daddy refused to spend the money to send me to another good school. 
Now, in terms of the, uh, the other uh, uh, piece of it that a uh, young man faced in Jamaica is how school administra uh, administrators uh, uh, react to um, homophobia and violence. So, uh, uh, reporting the abuse to school officials was perceived as futile because students, uh, participants believed that the teacher or guidance counselor they were reporting the uh, abuse to retaliate against them for being homosexual. And so for, to protect themselves, some participants used violence to counter the negative um, effects of homophobic abuse. So for example, the last high school I went to, the guys wanted to jump me because I was too feminine for the school. They plotted something uh, that they, they thought that they could actually beat me up, but I retaliated and stabbed them. I reported it to the Dean of Discipline and he did nothing. He told me that if I was truly gay, he would get rid of me at the snap of his fingers off the school compound. Man, I honestly wish I could have reported that school. I felt so powerless. I gave up totally because I couldn't take it anymore. It was damaging me psychologically. The other point that uh, another participant made was, um, if, you have, if you have to know, that you have to know the teacher who you can talk to, you have to know who will sit down and take the time and talk things through with you. And even with that, you have to try and use your head. You will find that a lot of gay kids here lie a lot about their identity all the time. So people won't suspect you. You might share your story with a guidance counselor and then they turn around and tell the other teachers what you told them. I don't want that to happen to me. I won't feel comfortable to go and share that what's going on in my life with a guidance counselor. The, the last uh, theme that emerged is the theme around the psychosocial impact of, um, of uh, school and sexuality-based violence. The pervasiveness of the verbal harassment and physical violence experienced by males who self-identify as gay or bisexual created an unsafe learning environment, which led to some participants disengaging from structural education temporarily or permanently. The lack of support and protection from educators and guidance counselors reported within some of these institutions made it difficult for participants to complete their studies. And one participant explained, I was afraid to talk to the guidance counselor because I wasn't sure how she would react to my sexual orientation. I really think the Ministry of Health should put safe, uh, safe security systems in these schools to protect people like me. Man, I was tired of it all, honestly. I couldn't take it anymore. I would go back every day and it was the same thing over and over. Nothing would change. Just the constant name calling and fights. Eventually, I just stopped going to school. Another participant cited his frustration with the process of reporting uh, this abuse to, um, to school officials. And he said, I told my mom about the incident at school and when they didn't do anything about it, we went to some LGBT um, organization for help and they took us to the police station. But after hearing about the process, like pressing charges and going through the courts and stuff, another thing is that my mother wasn't so knowledgeable about those things. So we just dropped it and moved on. I gave up my sports scholarship that I had gotten to, to go to that school and went to a lesser tiered school. The way I see it, it was the school for low achievers. I left before getting any um, subjects or my diploma. Now some implications and recommendations. Our findings really underscore the need for a robust evaluation of the Ministry of Education's uh, security and, and safety policy guidelines which promote a culture of uh, security and safety in schools, uh, failure to respond to acts of discrimination and homophobic violence communicates an implicit message of approval, which contributes to an unsafe environment that makes it difficult for affected students to learn, achieve, and develop. Therefore, a concentrated effort should be made to train all teachers, guidance counselors, and ancillary staff and administrative staff who have direct and indirect contacts with students. And of course, potential strategies to remedy the culture of harassment and violence are urgently needed. And finally, future research is also needed to explore in more in depth the risk and protective factors that influence school and sexuality based violence and the associated psychosocial impact on the lives of gay and bisexual youth in Jamaica. And I just want to say thank you to my uh, community partners and for the individuals who participated in the project. And I'll stop. Yeah. Great, thank you, Orlando. We have time for one very quick question. If someone has a question, unmute yourself and ask. Give us a lot to think about in terms of even the last speaker, Connie, around the context 
of where people are living, even though this is a different population. And so thank you for that. Um, we're gonna move on to our next speaker. I think Orlando folks can follow up with you if they wanna talk to you more about your research. Um, our next speaker today is uh, Jerry Neuter. He, Jerry is an assistant professor also within the School of Nursing. He's in the Department of Family Healthcare Nursing and his research primarily focuses on understanding the impact of environmental, social, and economic factors. So on social and structural determinants of health around adherence um, to HIV therapy and prevention of transmission, vertical transmission from mother to child. He works globally um, in Ghana, Kenya, Uganda, and Zambia, and has a very robust uh, research um, work that he's involved in. I'm gonna turn it over to you, Jerry. Thank you, Carol. Uh, um, thank you so much for the introduction and uh, thank you, Orlando. Uh, for that presentation. Uh, and good morning to everyone uh, for tuning in. Um, today I'm, present, I'm presenting or talking to you about factors influencing retention in care uh, among HIV positive women in Southwestern Uganda. Um, I know the background is something that most people on this call that uh, can really be uh, familiar with, but uh, for the sake of this presentation, I'm just going to uh, briefly go through uh, the So uh, Sustainable Development Goal 3.3 uh, 3 and 3.7 for actually is calling for uh, the end of the HIV uh, epidemic and the universal access to sexual and reproductive health care services by 2030. And meeting these targets actually requires many things and especially these three things that there should be retention in HIV care, uh, there should be increased access to antiretroviral therapy and also postpartum uh, health care. Um, and currently uh, antiretroviral treatment is recommended for all individuals living with HIV. And postpartum women are actually highly encouraged uh, to continue taking their ART and be retained in care. And retention in care here uh, means that uh, they are required to actually visit the healthcare providers for for a medical checkup and other uh, care within uh, every 60 days. Uh, that is a definition by the WHO. So poor retention in HIV care is actually associated with the following, uh, interruption in ART and consequential high viral load, uh, mother to child transmission of HIV, um, HIV, or HIV disease progression, uh, HIV transmission to partner and also increased uh, mortality. Um, currently, majority of postpartum women, um, uh, or if you look at the global, the global picture, majority of the women or postpartum women receiving ART are in Sub-Saharan Africa, and Uganda is one of the, has one of the higher prevalence rates of HIV among pregnant women uh, or postpartum women, with an estimated 120,000 pregnant women currently living uh, with HIV and still counting. Uh, approximately 85% of HIV positive pregnant women in Uganda enroll in HIV care or uh, are on ART or antiretroviral uh, therapy. However, many studies have shown that six months after childbirth, only 21% are retained uh, in care, which is a huge problem because we're trying to prevent still mother to child transmission and also for the subsequent pregnancies that the child will not also have um, a, or be infected with HIV. And this, uh, this framework uh, uh, actually published by Sachi and colleagues in BMC Pregnancy and Child Health give us a very brief overview uh, of, of the factors that influence uh, adherence or adherence to ART or retention in HIV care. And we look at the socioeconomic factors, we look at the maternal, physical health factors, and social and cultural factors, and not forgetting that uh, it is, it's going to be a new experience for the mothers because they are going to be caring for their newborn, and also that comes with a lot of issues that they have to handle, and all these 
have some kind of impact on um, on retention in care uh, after childbirth or adherence to HIV treatment after childbirth. So here we identify the gap that the main gap um, for this is that there is a high rate of loss to follow up uh, among HIV positive uh, postpartum women in southwestern Uganda. So we decided to investigate the factors influencing retention in HIV care among HIV postpartum uh, positive postpartum women in southwestern Uganda. So the, here I'll just give you a brief uh, overview of the methods that we use for uh, this study. We did explanatory uh, sequential mismethod uh, study, and for the quantitative, we surveyed 167 HIV postpartum women, and that's the analysis that we ran. And the qualitative, uh, uh, qual for the qualitative data, we interviewed 30 uh, women uh, who, who are HIV positive and uh, who are actually a postpartum women. And here we interviewed 15 who were retaining care and uh, 15 who were lost to follow up. So during the survey, we collected information on the phone numbers and everything. So the people who did not return to the clinic within 30 months, uh, sorry, within three months, that is 90 days, we follow up with them. And then we did the interview with them as well as the 30 of them, uh, so 15 of them who actually retained uh, uh, in care. And for the analysis, we did a thematic uh, uh, ana data uh, analysis or qualitative data analysis. I'm going to be giving you a brief, uh, just a summary of what we found. We found an interesting thing that food insecurity and other things that we already need socioeconomic factors and um, other um, cultural factors influence adherence to uh, retention in care among this population. However, we found very uh, a, a very interesting thing, something that we were not expecting. We found that uh, social support was actually negative, uh, negatively associated with retention in HIV care among this population. Um, we saw that the full sample result indicated that HIV postpartum women who were retaining care have significantly lower score on interpersonal social support compared to non retained groups. So when we found this, we were a little bit surprised because we we're expecting that with a higher social support, people should be encouraged to retain in care and also be uh, to be adhered uh, to be adherent to their uh, to the treatment. So we decided to uh, stratify the result into people, the women who are earning income and those who were not earning income. So in the stratified uh, sample, interpersonal social support was negatively still associated with retention in HIV care, although the association was only significant among the non-income and uh, any respondent. And then specifically interpersonal support among non-income any respondent who were retaining care was significantly lower compared to their counterpart in the non-retained group. And now, so when we found this, um, and when the, so we quickly published this uh, the short data in uh, BMC research notes. So I received uh, an email from a researcher from Duke University who actually said, oh, this is very interesting because we also conducted a study in Tanzania and we found almost the same thing. So what is happening here? So um, now we found an interesting thing with the qualitative data that I want to share with you and which might explain what is happening here. So first uh, for the qualitative result, we, uh, we found four things. Uh, one is the support and abuse from family members. Uh, we saw the third one was facilitators or facilitators of ART adherence and retention in HIV care, and then barriers to ART adherence and retention in care. And then they also give us some recommendation. Now, we found an interesting thing that people, the women, the same people who were providing them support, were the same people who were abusing them or stigmatizing against them because they are the same people who are closer to them. For instance, one of the participants, this is one of the many quotes that I just, for the purpose of this presentation at the time, the participant uh, three said that about her husband, when I'm sick, 
and I'm unable to go to the hospital to pick my ARVs, my husband usually pick the drugs for me and bring them to me. However, this same, this same husband, inf uh, when influenced by the second wife or the co-wife of this woman, becomes an agent of abuse and stigma, uh, uh, a person who stigmatizes her. Then she continues, my husband is the one that abuses me the most. He beats me because my, of my status. And he normally said that I'm good for nothing. And at times send me back to my parents. I find myself suffering. There were times that when my husband beat and abused me, I asked God to take my life so that I may not suffer anymore. I believe this is my co-wife who influences my husband to beat me or send me away. So this is just one of the many. There were some, some of them, they are mother is the one who abuses them and stigmatizes their sister or family members, sometimes their in-laws, say a horrible thing to them. And these are the same people at a point they, so, they provide some kind of support to them. So the same people and then uh, like the, the same kind of stream actually springing forth to different of water, so to speak, uh, a bitter water and a sweet water. So these might actually be influencing the survey results that we found, uh, we found there. Then the facilitators to the ART adherence and retention in care, well, some of them were actually it's about the love for their children and others community group that help them to be retained in care. Well, one of them said, I love my children the way I love myself. So it has made it easy for me to take the drug. I think that if I don't take my drugs, I will transmit the virus to my child. So I have to take it regularly. And then another one said, I'm, I'm a part of a family, uh, women's group here, uh, and we support ourselves with money. So when you become part of them, they help you live positively with hope. So this is about a community group of women who are HIV positive in this community. Uh, they form groups that support one another and kind of like uh, give them, and like um, some NGOs or nonprofit organization goes in there also to give them some sort of, sort of support to, uh, and give them hope and then they live in that community and then another one says sometimes having a phone is a great help because the health workers usually send me message to remind me of my appointment days and take the uh, to take the drugs then we go into the barriers uh, many things we saw also in, uh, in the qualitative data many things were actually described by these uh, women as factors that are actually hindering them from taking the, the uh, antiretroviral or to be engaged or retained in, uh, in the HIV care. One of them said, because I'm not drinking enough water and getting enough drinks uh, uh, or getting enough food most of the time, I feel so dizzy. So I decided to take my drug at night so that I can go to sleep immediately after taking it. And we know that on these ARTs and others, um, you need a lot of food and then you need to take all this food. And I think the, uh, my CIFA mentor, Dr. Sherry uh, Weiser, uh, does research in this food insecurity uh, thing and can say more to, to this as well. So uh, food insecurity here and also water uh, insecurity, as we can see, influence this or actually hinder these women from taking their, uh, their or taking their ART or be retained in care. Then another food is also a problem to me and it affects my taking of drugs. I cannot take my drugs when I have not eaten. Uh, another problem is transport. As the clinics are very far away from our homes without food too, I find it hard to travel that long distance with an empty stomach. With this COVID too, it is very hard to get food because those who used to give me work to do uh, to make money no longer do so. We collected this data also during the time that the COVID-19 uh, was still, um, the, the shelter in place and others uh, were still were still in full force. So, so uh, some of them, we were doing labor uh, like daily job with some people to get money like washing of clothes for them cleaning their home but that was also not happening around that time with the things that they can do to earn money so they were actually explaining that as well so we also asked them of recommendation and what do they think can be helped uh, can be done to help them in, in taking the, uh, the medication. So if I had a small business such as selling as charcoal to get a transport that I may pay for my transport to go to the clinic with ease. So this because of the distance and most of these, they have to go to the same clinic 
for all the time because some of them they did not also disclose their status to their partners. So what happened is they have to keep these uh, medical record and everything in the clinic, and no, but they don't take the record home for anybody to see. So they will have to uh, go to the same clinic and can't go to any other clinic, and it's very very far. Don't not forgetting that they have new babies as well to take care of and to go there with them. And one said, I request that when one misses her drugs, um, there should not be many questions. There should be measures in place to allow one to get drug in any other clinic closer to that person. So this is an um, issue where nurses also yell or health workers yell at them and also scold them when they do not come for their treatment or take their drugs and things like that. Um, so the third one, uh, quote here, said those of us who have babies who are four months old, the government should be providing us with soya. That's kind of like, a, so it's like soya bean and other food items for our babies to help us. Um, so the conclusion, um, we are hoping that there is a need for uh, attending nurses and we'd have to conduct a general assessment of women uh, during the antenatal period to understand their available, uh, available support to appropriately plan for their postpartum, okay, very, very important. And also we calling for need to do, uh, this is a small sample size, so can conduct a, a, a huge, a large <coughs> size longitudinal, um, study to actually investigate uh, these, um, these, some of these factors into detail to see how they are influencing retention uh, uh, in HIV care. And also intervention to improve uh, postpartum retention in HIV care is very important and could be helpful. Uh, this is the paper that uh, we published, uh, the report was a research note actually in BMC research notes and you can read more from that on the uh, interpersonal support. And as we all mourn the death of Dr. Paul Farmer, I just want to share with you uh, one of his quotes. It's a decent provision for the poor is a true test of civilization and I want to leave that with you uh, as you go through the day and I want to just thank uh, all these wonderful people from Uganda, UCSF, and also from Ghana. And funding for this project was uh, uh, given by UCSF School of Nursing, Gained Research Fund, and Population Health and Health Equity Fellowship Program. So thank you so much. Uh, yeah, happy to get questions. Thanks, Jerry. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I We have time for a couple of questions if people have questions um, while we're waiting. I wanted to say uh, this, your findings around working with women and people who are engaged in care and social support or family support is something that we've also seen here in the US. Um, and some of the studies that I've been involved in in San Francisco with the women's HIV clinics where we, that wasn't the purpose of the study, but in talking to the women, understanding that they come to the clinic routinely for support and that's their support system. And that um, recently women talking about not disclosing their status to their husbands 20 years, you know, so they're keeping it a secret from some of the outside of the clinic and they do find that support. We weren't looking at adherence, but it just, it sounded very familiar to me. Um, yeah, what about other folks? Do we have other questions out there? It's not a very questioning group, apparently. So thanks, Jerry, that it's really interesting and great to hear where you're going next. And um, we look forward to your next step. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we're gonna do Anissa. If we're, if you're ready, we can turn it over to you next. Um, I want to introduce Anissa, who is uh, Dr. Anissa Flenci, who is an associate professor in the School of Nursing as well, and she is with the Alliance Health Project and in the Department of Psychiatry and School of Medicine where I think you oversee the research that's at the Alliance Health Project. Um, Anissa, or Dr. Flenshi, excuse me, is a psychologist um, and um, she focuses on reducing health disparities 
among sexual and gender minority individuals, which is a really important topic for us in the HIV research world. I also want to acknowledge that Anissa received the inaugural Sexual and Gender Minority Research Investigator Award from NIH in 2018, and it's something we're very proud of. So I'll turn it over to you, Anissa. Thank you, Carol. Um, thanks for having me today, and so delighted to be able to present alongside um, all the folks who have talked about such important topics today. Um, I'm going to talk about reducing minority stress to optimize the health of sexual and gender minority people uh, who are living with or at risk for HIV. Um, so, you know, briefly today, um, I'll talk a little bit about how I think about understanding the health disparities that we observe among these populations, and then also about minority stress and understanding minority stress and biological mechanisms, and then how I think about eliminating disparities uh, to reduce uh, minority stress. So um, we know that sexual and gender minority individuals have higher rates of mental health and substance use problems. We also see higher rates of physical health problems among sexual and gender minority individuals. So things like poor general health status and also higher rates of specific diagnoses. So things like asthma, cancer, uh, diabetes and cardiovascular disease. Um, and so the really important question to ask is what accounts uh, for these differences? And so the minority stress model has been a really helpful model to understand um, and actually has been a thread that I've been hearing through the presentations today. This is the idea that, um, you know, experiences of prejudice and discrimination contribute to these health disparities we see, uh, that sexual and gender minority people also come to expect prejudice and discrimination uh, in their everyday experience that may lead them to modify their behavior, you know, asking if they're safe, um, and that concealment uh, of minority status also occurs. So, um, you know, being out, being not out about one's uh, minority status. And the last uh, component of the minority stress model is this idea of internalization of social stigma. So here's a very extreme example that comes from my home state of Kansas, um, the Westboro Baptist Church, but there's actually far less extreme examples that can also be really pervasive. So um, in trying to understand how minority stress might be related to biological outcomes, we embarked on a systematic review to look at all the literature that was out there that had some test of a minority stress component and a biological outcome. And so we found uh, um, that there were around, well, there were 26 articles that tested this in some manner. And that the, um, you know, there were relationships that were detected between minority stress and physical health, incidents of respiratory infection, immune response, HIV related laboratory outcomes, symptoms, treatment side effects, AIDS mortality uh, in pre um, ART days, changes in cardiovascular function, BMI, cortisol, and cancer incidents and treatment side effects. So a lot of different, you know, health biological outcomes that are being observed. And this led us to put together this model. Um, this is the overall conceptual model um, that uh, my work is following at this point. And the idea here you see on the left, you can see the different components of minority stress that we talked about, and that the impact of those components are then moderated by coping, uh, which could be actually substance use, or it could be a different coping strategy. And that then there's a mechanism and that that mechanism are things like like epigenetic changes, transcriptional regulation, also uh, dysregulation of the HPA axis, and that, that those uh, mechanisms then lead to alterations in biological function, um, which then lead to some of the uh, potential clinical outcomes where we observe health disparities or have observed relationships with minority stress. Now, I know it's a big model. Um, today, we're going to kind of focus in on my work here in looking at this mechanism of epigenetic changes and transcriptional regulation and also thinking about biological function. And I'm limiting my work today to work we've done in uh, sexual minority men uh, living with HIV. So um, the first study I wanted to mention is this one where we looked at how minority stress may be getting under the skin. We looked at leukocyte gene expression in sexual minority men living with treated HIV infection. 
The purpose of this study, again, was to really understand better that relationship between minority stress and physical health. And specifically, we wanted to examine the relationship between minority stress and gene expression, focusing on genes that were in this conceptual model related to inflammation, immune function, cancer, and cardiovascular function. So one question that comes up is why gene expression? Why look here? Well, gene expression has been shown to change in response to chronic interpersonal stress, which of course minority stress could be, also social uh, impacts like social isolation. And gene expression also changes in response to acute stressors. So things like a stressful exam or a laboratory stressor. Now, of particular interest to me as a clinical psychologist is that changes in gene expression can be observed in response to psychological interventions. So things like mindfulness-based stress reduction, meditation, or cognitive behavioral stress management, uh, promoting this idea that we may be able to quantify a response to a psychological intervention. Now, when we look at gene expression, we can look at single genes, right? So that's what we're looking at here. This is not my study, but this was a study where you see really differentiation of uh, gene expression, either upregulation or downregulation in two different groups, a control group and a group that underwent a trauma. So you can look at single genes. Or you can also look at biological pathways. Um, so you can think about how genes work together, patterns of gene expression. Um, and this is a particular pathway of genes that's known to work together. So for this study, this is a cross-sectional study, and we had 38 sexual minority cisgender men living with HIV who had all recently used methamphetamine. They were all on antiretroviral therapy and all had viral load less than 200 copies. Um, we did leukocyte RNA sequencing and we measured minority stress. So we're gonna look at this kind of correlationally in this per study here. Um, we looked again at differential expression of single genes, um, and of course, we adjusted for multiple uh, comparisons. We also uh, co-varied positive urine toxicology for stimulants. Um, and then we also looked at biological pathway analyses. You know, so here's the basic demographics. And what we saw is that uh, we divided our group into people who were low in sexual minority stress and people who were high in sexual minority stress. And we didn't see differences between those two groups. They were fairly equally divided. So here's our results. So on differential expression, there were 90 genes using a false discovery rate of 0.10 um, that were differentially expressed between our low minority stress group and our uh, high minority stress group. And of those genes, we looked at those lists of uh, differentially expressed genes, and we found that 41 of those genes had documented relevance to our four hypothesized mechanisms, inflammation, immune function, cancer, and cardiovascular function. Cancer is probably overrepresented here because the literature is really well described a lot of different uh, cancer genes. And you can see that we don't see a perfect checkerboard pattern here, but we do see some differentiation between those groups. Now, in looking at the biological pathways, we had 138 gene sets that evidenced two-directional perturbation, again, false discovery rate 0.10. And of those pathways, we saw pathways that were relevant to inflammation, immune function, cancer, and cardiovascular function. So the implications here um, are that pathways of inflammation, immune function, cancer, and cardiovascular function do seem to warrant future exploration. And of course, uh, replication is warranted. Um, this was a cross-sectional study and all of our participants had recently used methamphetamine, which does uh, limit the results um, to that uh, population in that time point. Um, and of course, all of these men were living with HIV and a central question is how, uh, how might this differ among people who are living without HIV, but still experiencing minority stress or stigma? Now, um, I have to say that I'm, I'm kind of a skeptic when it comes to this whole line of research that I've taken on as my career. Um, and, and I'm always surprised when we get a new result. And I just wanted to point out that this, uh, this paper that I just described is not a standalone result. Um, so here, uh, this project was led by my colleague, Will Vincent, who's now at Temple, but was at UCSF. 
Um, and here we looked at uh, kynurinine tryptophan ratio, which a higher um, KT ratio is associated with faster HIV progression among other poorer health outcomes. And in this study, we found that outness or openness about one's sexual orientation predicted a lower KT ratio over time among white sexual minority men living with HIV. But that effect didn't hold true for sexual minority men of color living with HIV. So here, this study really highlights that we have to really listen to and attend to the fact that minority stress can be very different for different people when their intersecting identities are taken into account, right? So um, outness is not just a, 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 a great uh, impact. It might depend on the intersection of identities. Um, that study was also not a standalone result. So this is one that's in process with my colleagues, uh, Delaram Daguni and Adam Carico at the University of Miami. And so here we're looking for evidence in DNA methylation. And we examined both epigenetic aging using Horvath's clock. Uh, we did this using uh, EPIC arrays and we, we measured both DNA methylation and used the EPIC arrays to derive estimates of telomere length. And this was among 52 sexual minority men living with HIV who use methylation amphetamine. And here what we see is a relationship between increased sexual minority stress and accelerated epigenetic clock. And we also see um, in, uh, that uh, greater sexual minority stress is related to shortened telomere length, again, estimated through DNA methylation. So we have multiple signals that are kind of highlighting the importance of this path. And so now I wanna think a little bit about how we can think about modifying this pathway and just tell you a little bit about the work that we've been doing in that area. So this is to think about how to improve these coping responses, potentially reduce substance use or improve coping and kind of change this downstream biological cascade. And so, uh, I developed uh, actually as part of a K23 award, um, uh, the awareness intervention. And this is for sexual and gender minorities now. And um, the idea is to have a cognitive behavioral intervention that helps people to cope with minority stress. So we created this nine session intervention. It's now a 10 session intervention because we now have added a first session that is all about intersectional, inter intersectionality and intersectional identities. And so, you know, briefly, we have these nine sessions, we have two sessions devoted to each of these components of minority stress that we discussed. The first session is typically psychoeducation around minority stress and the impacts that it has on physical health, so that specific stressor. And then the second session is really focused on increasing coping and skills related to dealing with that minority stress and also a values clarification about how someone wants to deal with that specific minority stressor. Um, if you want to read more about it, the PMID is down at the bottom. Um, so we tested this uh, intervention among sexual minority men living with HIV who used substances. Um, exclusion criteria were severe substance use disorder and uh, current bipolar or psychotic disorder. We tested this first in an open phase pilot with 10 men. Uh, there we looked at acceptability of the intervention and it was highly acceptable. And we also used information garnered through qualitative interviews to revise our manual, improve our intervention. We then tested uh, the intervention in a pilot RCT, randomized controlled trial of 42 sexual minority men living with HIV. And um, overall, um, we had awareness pitted in our pilot randomized controlled trial versus a neutral writing task so that the attendance, the requirements of being there, being with uh, an interventionist were the same. And we followed people at baseline, conclusion of intervention, and four-month follow-up. The outcomes we were looking at were really the feasibility of the trial. Um, and also we wanted to see if the primary outcomes signaled movement in the anticipated direction. So our primary outcomes were substance use, alcohol use, depression, anxiety, PTSD symptoms, ART adherence, and also viral load. Um, and then we also uh, had an exploratory analysis to identify if gene expression changes in response to the intervention. So we did demonstrate feasibility of the trial procedures. Uh, we met all of our benchmarks here. 
And we also demonstrated feasibility of the intervention to address stress related to intersecting minority statuses. So on average, our participants discussed over five minority statuses in relation to the intervention content. Um, you know, uh, wonderfully, uh, substance use, alcohol use, depression, anxiety, PTSD symptoms all moved in the anticipated direction. Um, adherence and viral uh, load were actually, so adherence was very high, viral load was very low, so we didn't see a lot of movement there, but there wasn't a lot of range for, for movement. Um, now, in terms of differential gene expression, we did not see differential expression of single genes over time. But when we looked at pathway analysis, we looked for over -re representation of genes within pathways. What we see is, you know, very few pathways were significant, again, here at uh, an adjusted p-value of 0.10 um, in the control condition over time. And we see a lot of pathways, 59 pathways in uh, that were um, had overrepresentation of genes um, for awareness over time and six pathways for awareness versus control over time. And those pathways that were uh, that evidence differences um, really are lighting up with things like um, immune function. So more to come on that. These are like brand new data. So the overall, the implications of this, awareness appears to show promise as an intervention, and there appears to be a biological signal associated with the intervention. We've now piloted awareness with sexual minority women and in groups with SGM people, um, and hoping to do a full-scale trial of awareness to reduce minority stress. So many future directions we're working on. Right now we're looking at the intersection of sex and gender to understand epigenetic markers of substance use and minority stress. And of course, a lot of funders have helped and a lot of people have helped. And I just wanted to say thank you for having me today. Thank you, Anissa. That was a whirlwind of <clears throat> genetic expression and sexual and gender minority uh, research. Um, questions. We have one minute left for questions from anyone today. Oh, Peter, Peter, go ahead. Yeah, really, really terrific stuff, uh, Anissa. Um, the, um, uh, the, particularly the interventions um, uh, showing, showing an effect uh, on some of these pathways. Um, um, do you, you know, what, what's, what's next for you in terms of um, uh, you know, interventional studies, uh, uh, you know, to affect these pathways and. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, the, those results literally, I got them last week. So I was, I was excited to be able to integrate them. And now I, I definitely always the skeptic. I'm like, wow, we really might need to look at this a little bit more closely. Um, you know, certainly a fully powered trial would help. I'm also interested in thinking about, you know, if the, um, DNA methylation as a marker to think about uh, more of the regulation level. Um, so that will be a future direction as well to, to think about as we go forth. Great, thanks. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Peter. Um, I, we're out of time, folks. We're, we're right down to the last minute, which usually happens here at these CIFAR uh, seminars. There's so much good work going on. I just want to, Thank everybody for presenting today, um, Orlando, Jerry, Natalie, and Anissa. And um, yeah, be in touch. We're all on global and love to talk to you all more about the research we're doing in the School of Nursing.